All right, so we are in chapter five, section two, and we are talking about the kinetics of chemical reactions. And I know when I say kinetics, you know, you want to think of something really complex, but it really just talks about the speed of a chemical reaction, how quickly something happens, how quickly do our products turn in, I'm sorry, how quickly do our reactants turn into our products, right? So our general equation, right? We have reactants that turn into products. So we can measure how quickly our products are formed, or we can measure how quickly our reactants are used up over a certain period of time, and that will give us a rate. Um, and so some reactions happen relatively quickly, and some happen relatively slowly. We've talked about um, rusting. That, that was a pretty slow reaction that's happening. But um, an even slower reaction, if you look up in the corner, I've gotten you two pictures um, of some very similar substances. So this is diamond, and this is graphite. I'm gonna erase this, P-H-I, graphite. So what you probably don't know is that diamond will spontaneously turn in to graphite. So think about um, the amount of disorder. Diamond is very, very highly organized. Graphite, not so much. So the diamond has more um, order and reactions tend towards the disordered, right? So we're gonna favor um, diamond turning into graphite. But when was the last time you saw a diamond turn into graphite? Because I sure haven't seen it. It's not gonna happen in a day, it's not gonna happen in an hour, it's not gonna happen um, in your lifetime, but eventually it will happen. Um, spontaneously, on its own. You don't have to put any energy in to make it happen. So why do reactions occur? And so when we look at that, really it's how the reactant molecules collide with each other. And do they have, like if you have two molecules, do they collide together with enough force? Are you jamming them together hard enough? And are they in the proper orientation? Because if one's facing one way and one facing the other way, if they're not um, oriented in the right way, even though they bump into one another, they're just going to float away again. They have to both be in the same or the correct orientation, and then they can react and make something new, right? Um, so it's, it's about two things. Are they colliding with enough force, and are they in the proper orientation for a productive collision? So there are a couple of different things that can affect the rate of a reaction. And they include three, three things we're gonna talk about. Temperature, the amount of reactant that you have, and whether or not you have a catalyst present. So we're gonna talk about each one of them and how they affect a reaction. If I can get to the next slide, there we go. Okay, so um, whenever we talk about the rate of reaction, right? We want to increase, if we want to increase the rate of reaction, we want to increase the probability of collisions actually happening. So if we increase the rate of reactions, we increase the probability of collisions between reactant molecules. So how, what are three different ways that we can do that? Here's an example reaction. And in this example reaction, we have some red molecules, and I've denoted them as R, R for red. Then we have some blue molecules, and I'm calling them B for blue. And then when those, when a red molecule and a blue molecule get together, they're going to create something new, and that something new is going to be a red-blue molecule. Okay, so this is our normal reaction, and we're going to compare our normal reaction to everything else. So how can we make this reaction go faster? Well, number one, well, B here. We can, whoa, we can add some flames here. Wow, that's some fire. <laughs> so what, what is temperature? If I put a fire underneath my reaction beaker, it's going to happen. It's going to heat up everything inside the beaker. What is heat? Heat is a measure of the amount of kinetic energy inside of a molecule. Um, so if it's moving fast, it's got a lot of kinetic energy. If it's moving slow, it has not so much kinetic energy. 
So what you can look at these over here and say, mm, not too much kinetic energy, I don't see them moving. But over here, do you see these little trails that are coming behind each of the molecules? That means that they're zipping around and they're going really fast. And so we've increased the temperature, therefore we have increased the amount of movement of the particles. So if you think about um, movement as, um, you could say, for example, um, cars on a road, right? If you have cars that are moving very slowly, are they gonna collide into one another? Probably not so much. But if you have cars that are going super fast, they're more likely to ram into one another and have a collision. And so if we increase our collisions, guess what? We're gonna increase our rate of reaction. So everything that we do here is going to increase our rate of reaction. So temperature is one of them. We can increase the temperature. And the second one, we can double the number of reactants. So if you look at the number of red, just red molecules, and you count them up, right, you're gonna have more red molecules here than you do here. Well, if I look at my blue molecules, right, I can count my blue molecules, I'm gonna see that over here in this beaker, I have more blue molecules. So if I increase my concentration of my reactants, I'm gonna increase collisions. So you can, you can do the same relationship um, with cars, right? If you have um, only a few cars on the road, they're not likely to come into contact with one another, so they're probably not gonna get into a wreck. But over here, whoa, we got a lot more molecules. And so it's much more likely that the molecules are gonna get close enough together to get into a wreck, or the cars are gonna get close enough to each other to get into a wreck. So if you increase the amount of reactants, you are gonna increase your collisions. The last one are catalysts. Catalysts do not actually get used up in a reaction, but they're like facilitators. So you can see the little green thing, it's like a cup, right? And, and the red can sit in the cup and the blue can sit in the cup. And when they're sitting close together, right, it's easy for them to react. And so catalysts will help that red molecule and that, that um, blue molecule to orient properly to make an optimal collision and therefore turn into a new substance. Now when that catalyst is done, it's gonna release that new blue-red molecule and then it's gonna go again and it's gonna do the same thing and it's gonna release another. Then bind another blue and red, release the blue-red and go again, right? Um, so the catalyst can keep repeating that same reaction over and over and over again. So these are three different things. All three of these things, so all three of these things here that we just listed will increase the rate of the reaction. And RxN is, um, is just an abbreviation for reaction. Okay, so when we write um, a chemical reaction, let me erase this for a second. Um, let's talk about these three things, right? We talked first about temperature. If we increase the temperature, we're increasing the kinetic energy of the reacting molecules. Um, whenever I think about kinetic energy, I think about my son. My son has so much kinetic energy, it feels like he is really bouncing off the walls all the time. Um, so he's got lots of kinetic energy. But me, I'm sitting over here recording a video. I don't have a whole lot of kinetic energy. I'm just kind of stationary, but he's bouncing off the walls, almost literally. <laughs> and so um, think about if there were a bunch of kids his age, oh my gosh, it sounds like a nightmare. Um, they're all bouncing off the walls, right? They're, they're more likely to collide with one another, causing reactions um, to occur. So the faster you run and the faster you drive, the faster your molecules go, whatever that is, the more wrecks you're going to have. Um, your amount of reactant, right? So the rate of chemical reactions increases with the amount of reactants. So if I had, a, I don't know, a hundred eight-year-olds at my house, that really is a nightmare. Um, how likely would it be that they would run into one another? Highly likely, right? Um, same thing with cars. The more cars you put on the road, more, the more likely you are to get into a wreck. So if you have more reactant molecules available for those collisions, um, then we're gonna have more reactions occurring. 
more collisions, more reactions. Um, and, and the other thing to kind of think about is when this happens, right, your, your overall reaction, you're going from reactants to products. So when that happens, if you're going to progress your reaction in the forward direction, that means that you're going to lose, you're going to have a loss of reactants, and you're going to gain products. So if you lose reactants, that's basically decreasing the concentration of reactants. And so if you decrease the amount of reactants, you're actually going to slow down the progress of your reaction. So as the reaction progresses, it's going to get slower and slower because you're losing reactant molecules. And that sort of makes sense. All right, the last one, presence of a catalyst. Oh, I don't want to leave all this on here. Okay. All right, let's see. Sorry about that. Okay, so a catalyst's job is to speed up the reaction. So we said, right, that catalyst can be the little, the little cup that holds the molecules close together so that they can then interact properly. But what do we mean when we say they can interact properly and easily? Well, you're actually lowering the activation energy. So do you remember the energy diagrams that we were drawing last time where we had energy on one thing and then we had time, right, of the reaction? And so we started and our reactant, I'm gonna put reactant right there, had a certain amount of energy. And then our product had a certain amount of energy. And we said that we're gonna start at our reactant and we're up at the top of the hill, but somebody's gonna give us a little push to get us to go down the hill. So that little push is our activation energy and now we can coast nice and easily down um, that hill. So from wherever your reactants are to the top of that hill is your, is your activation energy. So what I want to do to make this reaction go a little bit easier is to use a catalyst to lower the activation energy. So if I use a catalyst, I'm still starting at the same point for my reactant, and I'm still gonna end at the same point for my product. But what's gonna happen is that little hump that I have to get over is gonna be smaller. So it's gonna be a smaller hump, and then I can go down the hill. Okay, so that's what we mean by lowering the activation energy. You need less of a push to get that chemical reaction started. So when the catalyst does this, this little extra help to get the reaction started, the catalyst doesn't change. And so the catalyst can be used over and over and over and over again. And I'll give you a, um, a car analogy since we were talking about cars, right? Um, let's say that I'm at point A, here's point A. And I want to get over here to point B, right? So I'm driving along the road, I'm driving along the road, but oh my goodness, to get to point B, I'm going to go out. I'm going to have to go over a mountain. I go over my mountain. Okay, now I can get to my B, right? But what happens if there was a second road and that second road had a tunnel that went right through the mountain? and drop me off on the other side. So in this case, I'm gonna start at A, but instead of having to go over the mountain, I can just go through the tunnel and then reach my destination. Well, just because I use the tunnel, does that mean the car behind me can't use the tunnel? No, I didn't mess up the tunnel. The tunnel's still there. The tunnel is like the catalyst. The catalyst let me get from point A to point B more quickly, but I didn't use it in my reaction, right? So I can reuse my catalyst over and over and over again. The catalyst doesn't change. So it's not a product and it's not a reactant. So what do we do with So if your products go to reactants, you put your catalyst either above the arrow or you can put the word for the catalyst under the arrow. 
either one is perfectly fine, um, but either above or below, either way. Um, some examples of catalysts include acids, um, bases, metal ions. Also, inside of biological systems, you also have enzymes. Enzymes are also catalysts. And so I'm going to give you an example of an enzyme. Right, so remember we talked about last time we talked about hydrogen peroxide and we said that if you put hydrogen peroxide um, on something, it would break down into water and um, oxygen gas. Well, why? Why does that happen? So if you, um, if you get a cut, right, on your skin and you put hydrogen peroxide on it, you're gonna see something happen. It's gonna get white and it's gonna start bubbling and stuff and you can actually hear it. So there's a chemical reaction going on in there. Um, the hydrogen peroxide is actually interacting with a catalyst. It's, interact it's interacting with catalase. L -cat -a -l -a -s -e, catalase. So catalase is an example of an enzyme. This is an enzyme um, that will facilitate the conversion of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, into water and oxygen gas. So if you have a cut, that's what's gonna happen. But if you don't have a cut and you get some on your skin, does it get all white and bubbly? No. And that's because the catalase is inside of your blood. It's not on the surface of your skin, it's on the inside of your blood. So hydrogen peroxide will only work as a, um, as a cleaning agent if there's catalase present. So if there's catalase present, you make this oxygen gas and it's the production of this oxygen gas that cleans the area because um, nothing can really survive that much um, oxygen gas uh, in, that, in that small of a space. So that's what actually cleans it when you put hydrogen peroxide on a wound. All right, so oh, hold on, I gotta erase some stuff. All right, so I wanna know um, if the following conditions are going to increase or decrease my rate of a chemical reaction. So A, baking cookies at 400 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 325. Oh no, what did we do to our cookies? We burnt our cookies, we did. So they cooked faster, right? They cook so fast you burn them. Poor cookies, poor, poor cookies. So um, did we increase or decrease the rate of the reaction? For this, we increased the rate. So uh, let me put increase, right? Okay, taking medication every other day instead of every day. This is super important. So if you have a patient, right? And um, the doctor prescribes X medication um, twice daily, right? Or what is this, every day? So once daily. And the, the patient says, oh, well, you know, I, I'm just going to take one every other day. And that way my medicine lasts longer. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is if they take their medication every other day, they're going to decrease the amount so they're going to decrease the amount of medicine in the body, okay? When they do that, what's the problem? Usually that medication is there to help facilitate something um, that isn't working to work, right? And so if you decrease the amount of medicine in the body, there's less of it available to participate in whatever chemical reaction it participates in. So if you decrease the amount of medicine, that is actually decreasing a reactant. And so you are going to decrease the rate, right? Because you decreased a reactant. Let's see, uh, C, spraying an enzyme treatment on a stained carpet fibers to clean them. Well, if it's an enzyme treatment, what did we say an enzyme was? An enzyme is another name for a catalyst. A catalyst, so a catalyst is going to do what? A catalyst is going to increase 
the reaction, the rate of the reaction, right? So we're gonna increase it. That's what an enzyme does, right? So those, those spray things that you get on your, your, your um, like resolve or whatever it is, and you've got a stain on the carpet, you spray it and it says like, wait for however long to let the reaction happen, <laughs> an enzyme treatment, right? Um, to actually break down whatever's on the carpet fibers, right? All right. So we talked about enzymes a little bit as catalysts, but we're gonna talk about it in a little bit more detail because they're really, 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 really important for bio biochemical reactions in the body. And so most enzymes are proteins. And anytime you see an enzyme, a lot of times it ends in ASE. So you have some kind of name. Remember catalase, it ended in ASE. So they're gonna end in ASE. So those are enzymes. Enzymes, enzymes end in ASE. So enzymes can actually increase the rate of a chemical reaction by, get this, 10 million. A factor of more than 10 million. So reactions in your body happen so fast. And they have to. For, for everything to work inside of us, they really, really have to. And so the way that enzymes work, they want to speed up a reaction. But what they do is, you, you got to think about you have all these little molecules that are floating around inside of your body. And they're all kind of weirdly shaped. And in order for an actual reaction to occur, one thing has to be in the perfect orientation to interact with with another reactant. Because if they come together and they're like this, right, they're, they're not gonna form the right compound. So it's, the chemical reaction is not gonna happen. Even though they bump into one another, nothing's gonna happen. If they bump into one another like this, it's not gonna happen. If they bump into each other like this, it's not gonna happen. So there are a lot of collisions that could be non-productive. Well, what happens in um, an enzyme is that it has an active site. And so it's basically got like two little hands, right? And it's waiting. And it picks up one reactant and it picks up another reactant and it brings them close together so that they can then interact in the right way and create whatever it is that needs to be created. And then it releases um, the new product and then it can wait and grab another reactant, grab another reactant, make a product, release the product. And then it goes again, grabs another reactant, grabs another reactant, puts them together, reaction occurs, it releases the product, right? So that activation site um, allows it to grab onto specific reaction, reactants and then orient them properly to make the reaction go, okay? But look at that enzyme, look at that active site. That active site has a specific shape so this enzyme can only bind reactants that match that shape. So enzymes are very, very, very specific to the reactions that they catalyze. So every reaction has its own unique enzyme that catalyzes it, which is great because we have lots of different reactions going on in the body and we want to be able to regulate them very easily. And so if we have one enzyme that controls each reaction, we can control the amount of enzyme to control the reaction. So that's a good thing for our bodies. But the problem is, if that enzyme becomes defective, that's the only enzyme that can catalyze the reaction. So that reaction is just not going to go. If that reaction doesn't go, then you're going to end up with a diseased state. So an example is albinism right? We know that we have pigment inside of our hair, our skin, right? And that pigment is called melanin. So in people who have albinism, they do not have the melanin. Well, why don't they have the melanin? Well, there's a biochemical process that has to happen, bunch of chemical reactions, one after another. And then in the end, you make melanin. Well, there's an enzyme inside of that pathway that catalyzes one of those reactions and it's tyranase and this enzyme in people who have albinism it's mutated it's defective and so because our one enzyme is defective we don't make our product it's gone 
right? Just because one enzyme doesn't work. And so that albinism is not the only one. There are lots of examples. Um, and albinism is not necessarily lethal. Um, you know, you have to be very careful about sun exposure, but it's not, um, it's not dangerous in and of itself. But there are some like Tay-Sachs disease um, that, is, that is severe, very, very severe. Um, and so it can actually lead to very, very early death. So people who have Tay-Sachs um, usually die very, very young as children. Um, then they have some that are not so bad, like you've probably heard about people who are lactose intolerant, right? If they have a mutation in the lactase gene, they're going to have a lot of GI issues, um, gastrointestinal problems, but they'll be fine. Just like don't drink milk, right? Don't eat dairy. So things that have lactose in them, if you don't have the enzyme that can break down lactose, then when you consume the lactose, it makes you sick. So that kind of thing. Okay. Now I believe we're going to do problems. Yes, we're going to do problems. 